Hi, my name is Dean Hamer. I'm number 3028, and I support SB1. During these hearings, there's been a lot of discussion about the question of be whether being gay is a choice or whether it's an immutable trait. And I'm here to offer the committee the current view of the scientific community on this particular question. I do so as a Harvard PhD molecular biologist and chief emeritus of gene structure and regulation at the National Institutes of Health, where I published over 100 peer-reviewed papers and three books on this topic. Scientists like me think about sexual orientation not as a lifestyle, but as a phenotype, an observable set of properties that varies between individuals. We determine the sources of this variation through quantitative twin studies and molecular genetic mapping. The results of such studies are unambiguous. Genes are the single most important factor in determining a person's sexual orientation and outweigh all known shared environmental factors. Furthermore, sexual orientation is associated with two specific regions of the human genome, P20 to Q22 on chromosome 8 and Q28 on chromosome X. A recent Society of Human Genetics study dramatically confirmed these links with odds ratio of greater than 10,000 to 1. During these hearings, Representative McDermott claimed that being gay couldn't possibly be genetic because he said that only 5% of gay twins are concordant and no one's found the associated DNA. Both those statements are simply incorrect. The concordance rate is 10 times higher than that, and at least two specific loci have now been mapped and replicated. Taken together, these findings lead the scientific community to conclude that sexual orientation is a deeply ingrained innate trait with strong genetic and biological roots. So gay people no more choose their sexual orientation than do heterosexual people. It's part of all of our makeup. I hope that factual summary is useful to your deliberations, and I thank you, and I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you. Next up, Hi. Representative Thielen, followed by Representative McDermott. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, I believe a scientist, physician, and quite a few different titles, if you don't mind coming back up. <laughs> Could you, did you submit written testimony? Yes, I did submit written testimony, uh, and I've also emailed testimony to Representative Lee and other members regarding the science. And um, what is your number on there so I could go hunt that down? Uh, my official number is 302. No, 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 your number of testimony, or testifying. Uh, it's 3028, but I'll have to check if that has the scientific portion of the testimony, because okay. I actually wasn't going to testify on the, on the issue of marriage until I heard some of the nonsense that was, uh, I heard over at Lello, so I, I came could, in. Could you put your conclusion in layman's terms? Yes, I could. Okay, Being, gene being gay isn't a choice. Go, go ahead. <laughs> being gay is inborn. That, I'm just sorry, that say that again, I can't hear you. Being gay isn't a choice. Okay. It's just a part of people's makeup. It's not a choice. It's not a choice any more than being straight is not a choice. People don't choose to be straight. Suddenly, they just wake up when they're 11 years old and go, oh my God, I really like girls. <laughs> just like lesbians wake up when they're 11 years old and say, oh my gosh, I really like girls too. <laughs> It's just that simple, and there's been a vast amount of psychological research and of anthropological research which supports this. So it's not just the molecular biology or the, the hard science. It's all of the human sciences that support the idea that people have their sexual orientation, whether it's gay or straight or in between, because they're channeled, because it's born in, because that's the way that they are meant to be. Okay. That's the simple I Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Representative McDermott. Doc, can you come back, please? You didn't think you were getting off that easy. Come on now. You're a molecular biologist? Yes, I'm a molecular biologist. You have a PhD? I have a PhD from Harvard Medical School. In molecular biology? Uh, in biological <laughs> chemistry, yep. Okay. I. I have reviewed a lot of studies, and would you admit that there are also a voluminous amount of studies that uh, have the, the opposite view of what you're proposing for, forward, and they're also peer-reviewed? There are not any studies from molecular biologists that counter this idea. In fact, 
there is a vast literature on sexual orientation and its molecular biology, not only in humans, but also in a variety of different species, which has not only shown that it's genetic, but have actually identified the specific genes, the nucleotide sequences, exactly what they do and how they affect the brain. And it's not really that complicated. For example, in Drosophila melanogaster, I, let, just, there's a let, single master doc, switch. I'm, at, let, I'm asking the questions, okay? You, you had so a, there, uh, the answer is yes. There's a huge literature about the genetics of sexual Would you also agree there's a huge literature in the opposite direction? Not by molecular biologists. Uh, well, maybe, I disagree. About, Do you have any citations? Doctors, I got eight biologists? in front of me. I got some up in my office. Now, I'm not a molecular biologist, but please then explain the Spartans, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, the men at the time of Alexander the Great, where homosexuality was rampant and the norm. Did they all have a genetic deviation? Oh, dear. You're confusing molecular science with ancient history. Those are different oh. fields, actually. And so let me explain oh, it, that. It, As it, molecular it, biologists, it, okay. no, let me explain. So, um, I can get a, I can get a professor down at the university that well shows for, that elephants uh, fly. I don't think this is going to go anywhere, so wait, perhaps I should... So, well, answer you the question. You, you, you made fun of me, but you didn't answer the question. Please if, explain if the rampant can. homosexuality in the Spartans, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, and the men at the time of the Alexander the Great. Clearly, if it's genetic, there must have been a genetic mutation somewhere along the line. Correct? Now, let me say, first of all, that the anthropological studies that I've read have stated that because there were differing conditions, there was different acceptance and different reporting of homosexual activity. But in all societies that have ever been studied, there is a certain level of homosexual activity. It's really just a question of whether that is glorified and looked up to, or whether it is so put down and so discouraged that people are even afraid to report it. No, and let me further add that... No, no, I'm asking the question. No, 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 no
One was a rate of 10,000 to one, and the other one was 10 times. I, for, I, yes. I didn't quite get what those referred to. Okay, and I apologize, uh, trying to condense all of this research into two minutes is difficult, so I will explain those two numbers. 10,000 to one are the odds in favor of linkage at these two loci, chromosome eight and X chromosome. 10,000 to one odds in favor of means there's only a one out of 10,000 chance that the results that were observed were just by chance. So scientists never say, I've shown or I've proven that there's a linkage. We always give you a probability. When you get to one out of 10,000, it's good. I mean, if you had money, you should bet on it. Uh, no question about that. Uh, the other number I cited tenfold the uh, existing rate, yes, was, and the question about identical twins, the rate of concordance for sexual orientation. In other words, if one of a pair of twins is gay, what's the probability that the other one will be? Uh, it's a little bit over 50%. That's 10 times higher than just the average chance of being gay. Normally people have about a 5% chance of being gay. If your twin is gay and you have the same DNA, it's much higher, tenfold higher. And it's kind of by that rough logic that we figure out uh, the extent of genetic loading for a trait like sexual orientation. I hope that's a clear explanation. It's all in my book, Living With Our Genes, uh, or my book, Science okay. of Design. Okay, thank you for your uh, advertising <laughs> promotion of your book. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Representative Lowen, was that for the same testifier? Different one, same testifier? Yes. Okay, can you come back? We have additional questions. I'm sorry, doctor. Thank you, chair. Uh, there's been, I mean, obviously the, the question of choice has been at the crux of this entire discussion. And I think there's been some concession on one side that, yes, there is some kind of spectrum that some people are more likely to be attracted to the same sex. It's just a matter of fighting that feeling and repenting. Mm. Um, what is your feelings about, there, there's been some ex-gay testifiers, what is your feeling about gay convert to straight conversion? Is that uh, legitimate? Yeah. Well, as I've discussed, the underlying trait of sexual orientation, that is attraction, clearly has an innate basis. But the way that people actually behave is, of course, under their own control. And people can behave in a way that, you know, is opposite than the way they feel. And this is the basis for the idea of, of conversion. I've read a great deal of the historical and current literature on this, and it's quite remarkable. It started in the 1940s with electroshock, with castration, with all types of shock therapy, and with lobotomy. Thousands of gay veterans were lobotomized because they showed homosexual behavior in the United States military, and it's really quite drastic. Um, there's no evidence that any of that therapy has done anything except to mess up these people's lives. And it's for this reason that now all of the professional societies, American Society of Psychiatry, American Association of Psychology, et cetera, have um, discouraged this type of so-called reparative therapy. And I think that there are some districts that have actually made it uh, illegal. So um, I, I don't think that it, it, it doesn't seem to work. And people certainly have tried. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Representative Lowen, you had a question for uh, somebody else? Or oh, same person? Thank you. Um, so you were, uh, we were starting to get into the question of if there's other studies out there. So I'm, can you explain the process? I mean, when you're doing a study like this, what kind of literature view yeah. you do? So, um, when we started our study, even before we began collecting data, it was reviewed at the NIH for scientific uh, accuracy. And then, because it was such a controversial study, it was reviewed all the way up to the White House, uh, actually, which was then the Bush White House, not very radical. And, and they approved it because the head of the National Institute said this is a good scientific study. So the design was considered to be sound. Um, after the results were published, then quite a few other scientists also tried to do the same thing or to extend the results. Um, there were six replication studies that have been done so far. Five of them found very similar results and supported it. One of them found different results, a study from Canada. 
And the way that scientists analyze that data then is to combine all the data into a meta-analysis. And when that's done, it, it points to the results that I, I told you about. So the whole idea of science is that no one study proves anything. It just serves as the basis for, for further studies. And those either get the same results or they get different results. So that's the sort of scientific process. OK. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you. Representative Wally, you had a question. For uh, Mr. Wilson, please.